The chair recognizes the Sergeant at Arms. Maybe. The Sergeant at Arms announces the presence in the chamber of General Mark A. Milley, Chief, no. My oh. bad. Sorry. The Sergeant at Arms announces the presence in the chamber of the Honorable Deborah Lee James, Secretary of the Air Force. She is escorted by Lieutenant General L. Scott Rice, the Director of the Air National Guard. Major General William N. Raydell III, the Adjutant General of New Hampshire, and a member of the Naugus Board of Directors, and Major General Linda Singh, the Adjutant General of Maryland. With a Sergeant at Arms, escort our distinguished guests and her party to the platform, please. Our first speaker is the consummate leader, a great friend, personal to me. I think I told you last year, she's just one of my favorite people in the world for what she does and how she carries it off and the fact that she's a woman. That's secondary to the great job that you do. But she's a great friend and a believer in the National Guard. And as we found out last year, she's a good sport. Oh, there it is. Oh, there we are. So... I was told you can only pull off the selfie thing once, so I'm not sure what we're going to do this year. <laughs> but I appreciate your, your tolerance and your good spirit last year. We invited her back because in today's world, 12 months is a pretty long time. So ladies and gentlemen, the Secretary of the Air Force, Ms. Deborah Lee James. We'll do it again, all right? We'll do it again. Oh my goodness, thank you everyone. Thank you very much, thank you. Well, let me begin by once again thanking you, Major General Ashenhurst, for that kind introduction and wherever that rumor started that there's only one selfie per person, totally false. So I'm looking forward to, to doing it again if you're willing. And I just can't tell you how thrilled I am to be back here with all of you today. And it feels just like yesterday that we were together um, in Nashville at last year's Naugus. Um, I also want to take a moment to thank Major General Linda Singh and the fantastic hosts, our Maryland National Guard. Thank you for being such fantastic hosts. I'm looking out, I think we've got large, large numbers. I don't know if it's record numbers, but the participation looks to be fantastic. Um, I also want to recognize a few notables that I see sitting right up front. General Grass and Pat, it is fantastic to see you. And General Grass, I just want to say we are going to miss you something fierce as you now have retired as the Chief of the National Guard Bureau. You've just been a fantastic Chief. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We certainly are looking forward to fully having General Langell. He is fully with us, and there he is um, as our new chief. He just recently took over. He's 
already hit the ground running, as has our new director of the Air National Guard, uh, General Rice. Um, they've already made a huge impact, and we're going to be looking for, for great things from them in the future. And then I see some of our chiefs um, that I remember so fondly from serving with in the past. So I see General McKinley there, and see General Conaway. Uh, Russ Davis, are you out there? I don't see Russ, but I thought he was going to be here. Um, General Temple, I think I see you there in the front row. It's great to see you. And of course, General Keeley and General Shepard, former directors of the Air National Guard. So another fun thing about being here at Naugus, it's a little bit like old home week for me. Now, ladies and gentlemen, as you may or may not know, but my job um, as the Secretary of the Air Force has me spending about half of my time um, in the Pentagon or up on Capitol Hill. And the other half of my time, which by the way is the way more fun half of the time, is when I get to go out on the road and see our Air Force in action and also get to listen to the stories um, that our airmen tell me. And I want you to know that everywhere, everywhere I go, and I've been to a lot of places now in two and a half years, I see our National Guard in action. It was just in August that I was in Burlington, Vermont. Is there anybody here from Vermont? And I was with the Green Mountain Boys of the 158th Fighter Wing, and they were rocking it. They were doing a fantastic job. And then in June, I went to Toledo, Ohio. Is anybody here from Ohio? All right. I was with the Stingers of the 180th Fighter Wing. And then I was in Greeley, Colorado in April, the 233rd Space Group. All right, I always do this because I know they're gonna woo-hoo it, so that's good. <laughs> Last December, I visited the Arkansas Air National Guard. <laughs> the Flying Razorbacks in Fort Smith. And then in October, I got to meet the Mountaineers of the 167th Airlift Wing in West Virginia. And all of that, I'll have you know, was just since the 137th Naugus Conference in Nashville. And just a few weeks back from today, I was in, of all places, India. And in India, guess what they were doing? They were raving about the C-130 training that they were doing with the Rhode Island Air National Guard. And then earlier in the summer, I was in Ukraine. That certainly is a troubled country at the moment, but the Sunshine Division of the California National Guard is leading the Joint Multinational Training Group. And then finally, last but not least, I was in Estonia, where the Maryland Air National Guard has spent so much time teaching the principles of close air support. Do you know what they call them in Estonia? They call them the PhDs of CAS. Now, I think there's a certain ring to that title. Like I said, the bottom line, no matter where I go, you are there, and you are making a big difference. Now, I don't think I really need to remind anyone, because everybody is going to remember this. Tomorrow is the 15th anniversary of the terrorist attacks on September 11th, 2001. And that's a day, I think, that is seared into all of our memories. Certainly, I would suggest that everyone in this room will remember exactly where they were when those attacks occurred, when we first heard the news. And there is no single institution, as I step back and think it through, that has been transformed in the last 15 years as much as I think the National Guard has been transformed. During the Cold War, the Guard was a strategic reserve. But of course, today, you are fully, fully an operational force by design, moving towards even more seamless integration with the active component. Now, I like to think I had a little something to do with pushing that approach forward back in the 1990s, meaning using our National Guard and Reserve in operations less than an all-out war. I certainly was a big advocate of that back in the days, and look how far everyone has come. Since 9-11, you have had nearly 700,000 individual deployments to the CENTCOM AOR, and guardsmen are there right now as we speak, and they are bringing the fight right on home to Daesh. And on top of that, you're always standing ready to protect us here at home. 53,000 of you activated during Katrina, 12,000 activated during Hurricane Sandy. There were about 200 that just activated recently to, um, to deal with Her Hurricane Ermine just a week or two ago. And then, of course, 8,000 have conducted operations in CONUS just in the last month. 
fighting fires in California and responding to flooding in Louisiana. And let, let us never forget that our first Air Force continues to defend the airspace of the United States, overseeing 15 units working 24-7, keeping the skies clear and ready at all times to respond to threats to our homeland. So once again, I come to the bottom line. We are asking more of you. We are utilizing your talents more now than ever before, and I would say that is precisely because we need you now more than even we did before. And here is why, at least on the Air Force side, here is why. Because our active duty force today is the smallest it has ever been since we became a separate service in the year 1947. More specifically, our active duty end strength is 200,000 people fewer than it was back in the 1990s when I had the pleasure of serving as the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Reserve Affairs. So we are smaller today than we have ever been. Moreover, across the Air Force, our aircraft are the oldest that they've ever been. 27 years old on average, but of course that means many fleets are much older, and yes, some are uh, younger. Finally, less than half, less than half of our combat air forces today are considered to be sufficiently ready for a high-end fight, meaning the kind of fight where there are integrated air defenses, surface-to-air missile, the type of a fight where we could be shot down or interfered with in a substantial way. And only half of our combat air forces are considered sufficiently ready for such a fight. Yet while all these dynamics are happening, we are engaged all over the world, all over the world. We're fighting Daesh in the Middle East and wherever they should rear their ugly heads. We're of course very active in Asia. We're monitoring North Korea. We're supporting freedom of navigation flights in the South China Sea. And increasingly, we're rotating more forces and we're standing firm in Europe against a resurgent Russia. In short, we are supporting our allies and American interests in all parts of the globe, and we are making ends meet with this much smaller force precisely because today's Air Force is more integrated across the active duty, the National Guard, the reserves, much more integrated than 25 years ago. And tomorrow's Air Force will continue to move more and more and more in that direction. Oh, and did I happen to mention the fact that the use of the Garden Reserve also happens to be a great value for the American taxpayer? Well, duh, that too is a pretty big deal in these days of one budget crisis after the next after the next. So for all of these reasons, we're committing to making sure that the Garden Reserve gets a seat at our decision-making table for all of the processes, including the budget processes, which are so important, and you are there and also that we leverage our National Guard and Reserve assets as much as possible. And once again, we are trying to do just that. Now today I want to give you a few updates about some of the total force approaches that we are taking. Some of them are tried and true, some of them are a bit new, but they are all geared toward more and more total force. And as you may know, I am constantly tracking on three priorities for our Air Force. Number one is taking care of people. Number two is balancing our modernization needs with our readiness needs because we have to improve on both. And number three is making every dollar count precisely because we're in a tough budget crunch. And by the way, we are focused on all three of these priorities in a total force way. So first, let's talk a few issues concerning people. The amazing people in the Garden Reserve are essential to our military's future success because you see, we turn to your experience the continuity that you bring, and we do it over and over again. You are true professionals, and we very, very much need you in the fight. So this year, we have started to grow the Air Force, coming on the heels of year after year after year of reductions in our force. And we're going to be on this path for modest growth over the next several years. And once again, we're going to do it in a total force way. And as the increases happen for the National Guard, of course, we have to recognize that that growth in the Guard needs to fit the militia construct. 
In addition to trying to address our fighter pilot shortage, because that's one area we're concerned about and we certainly need to grow that force, we're also looking to grow in areas like cyber and space and maintenance across the board where we're short. And of course, in all of these areas I just mentioned, our National Guard and Reserve have a major contribution to make. Another uh, uh, way that we're taking care of our total force airmen is, for looking, is by looking for new and expanded ways to integrate, integrate across all of the components. And in addition to working on the successful concept such as the associate units, I think you're going to be seeing more of that in the future, and also funding, thinking through and funding in advance our mandate funding so that we can bring people on to active duty in a regular manner. We also have got some new examples of integration, fairly new examples. So for example, Colonel April Vogel, right here from the Maryland Air National Guard, is now commanding um, for the first time ever an active duty unit, the 6th Air Mobility Wing at MacDill Air Force Base. And by the way, we also have some examples of active duty airmen who are now commanding National Guard units. Here's another relatively new example. At Seymour Johnson Air Force Base, we're setting up what we call the integrated wing, and this will be integrating fully at a command level, and underneath that command level will be an active unit, and in this case, a reserve unit, but we'll be looking to see whether that form of integration can bring us synergies, and if so, we might expand it beyond that one um, example. A year ago, I told you that we were committed to streamlining our processes, taking a look at our processes, making it easier for people to serve in our Guard and Reserve, particularly those coming off of active duty. And the scrolling process was one in which, of course, we transition people from a regular commission to a reserve commission, but it was taking too doggone long. Well, I'm not here to tell you that we have fully fixed that process. We haven't, but we have made some progress. Today, I do want to report that we've cleared a six-month backlog of applications for transitions, and we're continuing to make improvements to the process. And here's another one. I recently visited the 113th Wing and received a briefing on a concept or a an approach called Arrows. Anybody want to boo for Arrows? I didn't hear a lot of good things about Arrows. In fact, it was rather mind-boggling to see how much work it was taking to get your pay orders straightened out. So I do think we need to put some focus on this one as well, and I have asked my A1 to peel back the onion and figure out how we can get on that and see if there's something that can be done about that process. And we're also on it when it comes to reviewing duty status reform. So as the lead proponent within DOD, we want to try to reduce the number of duty statuses, separate duty statuses, by which we access members of the Guard and Reserve to bring them on uh, active duty. Currently, we have 32 such statuses. We want to see if we can make it easier for total force airmen to serve with us in an operational capacity, but that also includes being able to switch between statuses with greater ease when the time comes. Airmen, after all, shouldn't have to have a PhD in IT or accounting to get through our systems and to get paid. <laughs> Finally, as we ask our guardsmen uh, to do more, especially do more in the way of combat deployments, we need to be cognizant of the impact um, that such deployments may be having. And of course, there's a variety of impacts, and this is a total force issue as well. But one example I want to bring to your attention is that we need to pay more attention to what we call the invisible wounds of war. Now, invisible wounds of war can be post-traumatic stress, they can be traumatic brain injury, or other cognitive or uh, psychological or behavioral disorders. We call them invisible wounds, but believe me, they're not invisible to the person who's feeling them, and they're not invisible to their families either. So what we're doing is we're working to improve our processes from identification, diagnosis, treatment, evaluation, and then either reintegration or transition 
for airmen who have invisible wounds. Next week, we're going to launch an internal workshop to address gaps in how we identify and respond to these wounds. We're going to have a special focus on these specific difficulties that are faced by our total force airmen. We're then going to brief it up the chain, and from there, we're going to develop an action plan for the way forward. So these are just some of the areas concerning people um, that are important for us going forward. Let me now turn to readiness and modernization and mission. Another way that we're looking to improve our total force thinking is by aligning missions and equipment across all of our components. We've analyzed about 46 primary Air Force mission areas now to determine the right mix of our components for different missions. And one area where we know the Guard has unique skills and capability is in cyber because of your close work with the states and in some cases because of your civilian jobs. Some of you have gained experience every day that we can leverage better in defending critical cyber infrastructure. It's no surprise that, you're going, that we're going to rely on the Guard more in this area. By 2019, we expect to have Guard, um, we expect to have cyber units in 34 states in the National Guard, consisting of almost 3,000 cyber trained service members. Right here, once again, in hometown Maryland, you have 300 airmen in the 175th Cyber Operations Group working with your state and local governments, and you are the only Air National Guard unit capable of performing both offensive and defensive cyber operations. And by the way, yeah, let's give them a hand. And when your director of mission integration, Lieutenant Colonel Aaron Hughes, takes off his uniform, guess what? He's the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Cyber Policy. So that's another example of guardsmen taking the lead. Um, remotely piloted aircraft is another field that has a lot of equity in the Guard. I predict more to follow. ISR, for many of you, I'm sure you already know, is the number one area capability, I should say, requested most by our combatant commanders. Since 2012, Air National Guard RPA units have flown more than 500,000 hours in Title X orders, and that number is only going to go up, up, up. We recently increased the number of RPA combat air patrols in the Guard. We did this because we funded appropriately in advance so that we could bring people on active duty. And by the way, using our Guard and Reserve in this fashion is a centerpiece of what we call our RPA Get Well Plan. And we couldn't get there without you. Nor, we, nor could we perform our, what I'll call our more traditional warfighting missions without you. Earlier this summer, I attended a red flag exercise at Nellis Air Force Base. It's one of our uh, premier combat exercises. It's where we prepare for the eventuality of the high-end fight. And while I was there, I ran up against um, guardsmen from New Jersey, D.C., Georgia, and, and uh, Washington State, all of whom were training for the high-end fight. Next year, the New Hampshire Air National Guard is going to be the first Guard unit in the country to receive the KC-46 Pegasus refueling tankers. And the Vermont Guard, of course. <laughs> and the Vermont Guard is going to be getting the F-35 Lightning in the year 2019. So I'm trying to give you a sampling of some readiness approaches, what we're doing today, but also we're putting our money where our mouth is for tomorrow, for funding of the equipment of tomorrow. And I could go on, but I hope you get the picture, that by leveraging the expertise of the National Guard, we're enhancing today's readiness and the force for the future as well. Now, I've talked about how thinking in a total force way makes the Air Force run more smoothly and how the Guard and Reserve are a great buy for the taxpayer, which, by the way, is central to that third priority of mine, the one I call making every dollar count. And that is why, making every dollar count, we are trying hard to speed up our acquisition processes, especially in the world of urgent warfare requirements and cyber solutions. The problem here, if you boil it way down, is that we have an industrial age acquisition process that's trying to compete in a digital world. And we can't afford to keep going in this way because we end up giving our airmen yesterday's technology, but we end up delivering it three years from now. So when, when you think of Air Force acquisitions, 
you may not be thinking about cutting edge technology startup types of approaches, but we increasingly are trying to move in that direction and think that way. And that's why our Secretary of Defense, Ash Carter, established what we call the Defense Innovation Unit Experimental, or otherwise known as DIUX. He put one of these entities in the Silicon Valley, he put another one in Boston, and the idea of these small teams is they are trying to connect all of us in the Pentagon with some of the innovative startup companies, some of the innovative technologies um, that don't typically come to us in Washington. These companies don't typically do business with the DOD. And the DIUX, by the way, relies on people who have both government and um, uh, company experience, people from the National Security Council and people from Google and people who have done both. By the way, DIUX is populated to a high degree with citizen soldiers and sailors, airmen and marines. So the reservists and National Guardsmen are a big part of DIUX. And instead of a director or chief, they have a managing partner. So who do you think they tap to lead it? None other than Raj Shaw, a former executive in Silicon Valley who spent 12 years flying for my very own New Jersey Air National Guard. So once again, leveraging the talents of the people in the National Guard and bringing them in and doing significant work for us in significant uh, targeted areas. Another great example of integration. Now, I know one of your main goals this weekend is to set your legislative priorities for next year. And boy, legislation, our bills, our appropriation, our authorization bills, these are all top of mind with us as well. We're very, very focused on trying to uh, get these uh, bills through as quickly as possible. Unfortunately, it appears that a continuing resolution is uh, looking pretty inevitable at this point, and assuming that that is in fact correct, it will be the 10th straight year that we haven't gotten an appropriation by October 1st. And one message I want to get across to all of you is that a short-term continuing resolution, one that would take us several months into the future, perhaps into early December, um, this is the type of continuing resolution that we could manage our way through. We've had 10 years at least doing so. So I hate to say it, but we've become fairly adept at managing through a short-term CR. But I also want to tell you, if we get into a long-term situation, and I've heard some people talk about the possibility of a six-month CR, or even worse yet, a one-year CR, this would be very, very damaging. Um, number one, it would hamper the budget trajectory that we're on in the Air Force, which is modest growth. So if we end up with a long-term CR, that means $1.3 billion less for the Air Force budget. Uh, number two, it would certainly, let's bring it on home, it would certainly affect the training and readiness of the Air National Guard. I can't tell you a chapter and verse exact, exactly how, but I can't see how flying hours would fail to be impacted. I think they would be. And there cer certainly could be impacts on drill weekends, at least delay in drill weekends. Um, this could happen as well. Number three, we would uh, not be able to replenish our stocks of precision munitions, which we very much need for the current fight in the Middle, Middle East. Uh, we wouldn't be able to buy the right numbers of munitions going forward because we'd be capped at the previous year level. We'd also be capped for the production of the KC-46 tanker. Uh, we would be limited on our B-21 bomber funding at FY16 levels. And there would be over 50 military construction projects that could end up getting delayed in some way. So some of these would even impact some of the top programs like the bed down for the F-35. And finally, once again, bringing it on home, if we end up with a long-term CR, there would be no National Guard and Reserve equipment account. At least there would be no new account for FY17. You can't possibly have one without an FY17 appro appropriation. So that would further retard the efforts to modernize for our National Guard. The bottom line is we're working very hard to take care of people, balance our modernization and readiness, and make every dollar count. 
but it is increasingly hard uh, and difficult as we enter another year of fiscal uncertainty in Washington. Short-term CR, okay. Long-term CR, very, very bad. So that is my message to you. And also, finally, let's not forget, sequestration is still the law of the land in FY18. Everything I just said gets much, much worse if sequestration comes back to us in FY18. So I never miss an opportunity to call upon the Congress, please, please lift sequestration for FY18 and beyond. Now, I've spent most of today talking to the airmen in the room, but I also want to just take a moment to address the Army National Guardsmen who are here as well, because the work that you're doing is also critical to our national security, and I certainly respect and recognize the important leadership roles that you're taking. Units like the 36th Infantry Division of the Texas National Guard, you're commanding the Train, Advise, and Assist Command South in Kandahar, Afghanistan, and there's more than 16,000 Army Guard soldiers who are deploying to conduct security cooperation activities this year. Your new Secretary of the Army, Eric Fanning, he's been a close friend of mine for many years, and I know that he is laser focused as well on the total Army, just as I'm focused on the total Air Force. And the absolute same story goes for General Milley, who I believe is your very next speaker later on today, and Lieutenant General Cadavy as well. So you too are in very good hands. As I begin to wrap up my presentation today, in the Pentagon, I will tell you, we so often focus so solely on what you're doing when you're in uniform, but of course, that's not the whole story. That's only part of the focus. In your civilian lives, you do things that we can't do, and you learn things that we can't necessarily teach. We're very, very fortunate to have access to your warfighting skills and to your civilian experience. And that combination, by the way, I think is the real secret weapon of our National Guard. Our citizen soldiers and citizen airmen give us flexibility and unique capability for our country. And just like the regular Army and the regular Air Force, you too have chosen a higher calling, service to others, defending the United States and the profession of arms. And that is why total force thinking has become so very central to our work. We've asked a lot of you over the last 15 years, and I have to give you my honest assessment. I don't think you're going to see that reliance going down anytime soon. And that's why we need your input for our strategies. It's why we're committed to recognizing your sacrifices and supporting you even when you take the uniform off. So I want to thank you again for all of your commitment to service. Thank you for de your dedication to the common cause. Um, aim high, one and all, as we say in the Air Force, and I hope you have a fantastic 138th Nogus Conference. Do you have time for a few The secretary says she has time for a few questions. There are microphones in the middle of the uh, auditorium if you'd like to come forward and, and ask a question. I want to tell people Russian how they're Russian microphones. Good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, thank you for your leadership and thank you for coming and spending part of your day with us today. My name is Tim Rice, I'm Adjutant General of the South Dakota National Guard. We're the home of the 114th Fighter Wing, which has got 40% of the female fighter pi pilots in the National Guard, right there in Sioux Falls, right. South Dakota. <clears throat> my, my question to you is, I know the Air Force is smaller than it's ever been. You made the, made the case of that and that the airplanes are older than they've ever been. So what can the 3,900 people in this room do to help you improve on those two areas. Anything you would uh, give would be great. Well, I mentioned um, a long-term CR or what's going to happen in the FY17 budget more broadly. I'm a believer in 
take step A and follow by step B and then come C and D. So what we need to do is we need to grow over time. We need to do it in um, a disciplined way. And if we can just stay on the budget trajectory, which we're now projecting, which does require as well the lifting of sequestration. So if all of you are basically in agreement with that and as you set your legislative priorities, I would just ask to keep keep that in mind. No long-term CR. Let's stay on the trajectory that we're on to, to gradually uh, grow. And we must lift sequestration. And instead of having artificial budget caps, let's fund our military a little bit more appropriately vis-a-vis -vis what the threats are confronting us in the world. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, hi, I'm Colonel Nick Gentile out of the 169th Fighter Wing in South Carolina. We had a, a chance to meet you at the cyber conference in Charleston, your home. And uh, I'll make our first pitch that we're F-35 ready. Um, <laughs> in, um, to continue though, the three areas, and I'm only gonna ask one question, but the three areas, F-16 modernization, um, MPA, and the MPA shortage, and the last one being um, at ground collision avoidance for F-16s, um, because guard lives matter. But the, uh, out of the National Commission on the Structure of the Air Force, and your support, ma'am, have, um, have been instrumental in helping bring our utilization in the Air National Guard forward a good generation. And with that has come all of our deployments as well as our agile combat support. We've been short MPA, and we have been for a while, and from when I worked on it about two and a half years ago with ACC, we know that that's still a major limfac. So I'm wondering what is the plan to get enough MPA for the Air National Guard and the reserves to be utilized both in exercise and in combat deployments as well as under 12304B? You know, it's interesting. Part of my um, overall pitch of things that I'm proud of for the Air Force is that we have robustly uh, funded mandates to bring people on to active duty for differing periods of time. Now, I'm sure we could always do more. I'm sure it's not enough to cover all of the concerns. But I will tell you that we have been doing more and more and more of this um, in the future. So I guess it's a relative situation, but we have done way, way better than if you go back in time three, four, five years ago, and it's been steadily increasing, and I would expect that we will continue to do so. And as we start to look at any reductions that have to be take, taken, this is an area that we have um, actively attempted to protect. So again, I'm going to have to go back and try to calibrate what I'm hearing here, but my information is we've done a pretty good job, at least at the big picture level of funding mandates. As far as F-16 upgrades, I mean, this is something that we're very much working on, but truth in advertising. I mentioned our budget approach. What I didn't mention is even with our budget approach, for the FY17 budget, which remember is a little bit now in contention because if we end up with a CR and all these different um, dynamics I mentioned, but even under our budget approach, we couldn't afford everything. And one of the things that we had to take a knee on and do a little bit less on was some of our upgrades to fourth generation um, aircraft to include F-16s. So that was one of the things that we couldn't afford more of because we had to, uh, we had to make some kind of priority decisions. But it's going to happen. It just might be stretched out over a longer period of time. And in terms of the auto GCAS, I feel certain that too is coming. It's a question of over what period of time and at what level will we do each of the components. But I certainly am a believer in, in that, and that's going to come as well. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I'm uh, Major Andrew Sanchez. I'm from the 150th Special Operations Wing. Um, I just wanted to talk. Um, uh, so last year, 47,000 uh, people died of drug overdoses, which is over one and a half times guns. Um, nearly 50% of the prison population uh, in the federal uh, prison system is drug-related offenses. and uh, nearly a third of our uh, prisoners are foreign nationals due to drugs. 
And as you were speaking, the high demand of ISR assets, um, we also have a high demand of ISR here on our border and protecting our own homeland, which is something to, uh, I've, I'm a RC26 program manager and I've seen the demand. Um, being the guard, how we're kind of posed to help out here at home and how is on the big Air Force scale meeting the demand for ISR here at uh, our own borders? I visited South America several months ago, including Jayadev South, um, the command in the Caribbean, and was very, very impressed with what I call a little bit of Air Force goes a long way, and a little bit of ISR goes a long way. A little bit more ISR goes even farther. And so I came back from Southcom, and one of my takeaways was to look for ways that we might bring more assets to that theater of operations. And in a training environment, get good training for our airmen that we needed to get anyway for our training regimen, but at the same time contribute to the important operational missions, which include uh, drug interdiction. And so actually, not too long ago, literally a few weeks ago, we conducted what I would call a pilot program. It was a five-day period where we, bought, we brought quite a few assets to bear. We did it on a kind of a no-notice basis, didn't advertise it in advance. But there were a variety of additional assets, including additional ISR assets. And it was almost like a combined command and control exercise of a fairly large scale. So our people got great training, from what I'm told. And the product, you might say, the operational product uh, that came out of it was thousands of pounds or thousands of kilos seizure of cocaine that didn't reach um, U.S. shores. Now, of course, we detected it. Uh, others did the arrest. There were, I think, 17 or 18 um, uh, people arrested for drug trafficking. This is a five-day period that I'm giving you. But it made me realize that you can get a double bang for your buck. And this is a region which is close to U.S. territory. If we were to redirect at least some additional training uh, sorties in this area, we could spend our training dollars and we could contribute to that operational mission all at once. So I do believe we're going to do more of that. By the way, we also, believe it or not, use some of our space and cyber assets in kind of new and creative ways, and I won't say anything more about that other than what I just said, um, But because um, we don't want to give away too much information. But the point is, there are some creative things that we're doing, and we are thinking much more in that direction. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, Lieutenant Hewitt from Montana. My question is regarding to additional duties. Um, and with the elimination reassignments of them and moving to the CSS for specifically the active duty, how do you see that benefiting, benefiting the guard, um, knowing, I mean, you don't know that uh, most units do not have a CSS to reassign them to? Well, um, there's a line in that memo, and I wrote it in myself, so I remember it quite well, and to paraphrase it, the line went something like this. It said to all commanders, because this was a, a memo ultimately uh, to our commanders as well as to our airmen, that if you don't have a CSS or you don't have CSS assets, and if this duty is not adding value to your unit, you shall hereby be notified that you can stop doing it. Just stop it. And we furthermore, there's another line elsewhere in that memo which directs the IG to not inspect units against these various duties if no CSS exists and if the commander has determined to stop doing it. Because I learned throughout this project that we could direct stopping doing certain things, but if it wasn't also updated on the IG side of the ledger that commanders and units would get inspected to uh, accomplish things that we were trying to stop them from doing. So we're trying to get our arms around this. And by the way, I don't believe that this is the be all and end all. I look upon this as the first step in the National Guard, even going back a year or so. Um, uh, 
our uh, then chief of the Air National Guard uh, stepped back and looked at uh, the computer-based training. Was there a way that we could do that differently in the National Guard to try to free up some precious time for our people? And we're going to leverage the work that was done there because uh, that's going to be the next thing that we take on on our side. How can we reduce the amount of time that's put toward computer-based training? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Colonel Denise Boyer, and I'm one of the Air National Guard members who's had the opportunity to work in the Pentagon and work in OSD. I've heard your testimony advocating for the next round of BRAC. Army's also asking for the next round of BRAC. Air National Guard units have been impacted by mission change. That's challenging the sustainability of some of those units. What is the Air Force doing to ensure that the Air National Guard is involved in their next round of planning for BRAC? We have asked as a total Department of Defense for the authority to conduct a new BRAC round. I think we've asked four years in a row now. And by the way, just to size the problem for all of you, and I'll just speak for the Air Force, we believe we have about 30% excess capacity. That doesn't mean 30% too many bases, but it's kind of a, think of it as a, um, a rough order of magnitude estimate that we probably have 30% too many buildings, 30% too many runways, 30% too many of this, 30% too many of that. So we know we have too much, and we want to shed some of that structure so that we don't have to keep spending money uh, to keep it up. That's what it's all about. It comes back to the budget uh, crisis. Bottom line, though, Congress, for the fourth year in a row, has basically said no. So the authority has been denied in both houses of Congress. Uh, it for sure is not going to happen. Now, what are we, to the second part of your question, what are we doing to try to make sure that the various units around the country for the Air National Guard remain um, viable and hopefully that there are follow-on missions and whatnot and I realize there has been uh, turbulence out there. The way we do that is we work very closely with now General Langell, General Rice and others to talk these matters through and sometimes many times really it's the needs of the total Air Force and if the needs of the total Air Force suggest that things have to change and at the unit level then they have to change, and then we have to manage our way through it um, as best as we can. But I think over time there has been a lot of effort put into preserving as many units as possible, meaning don't have them go away altogether, but rather give them new missions, give them new assignments, retrain people, and give people those opportunities. So that's been the focus. We haven't been 100 percent successful, but that has always been um, our goal. Thank you. Thank you. Secretary James, thank you so much for taking some time out of your weekend to spend with us. It really means a lot. Um, as a memento, we have a little something different this year. I'd like to present you with this book, What So Proudly We Hailed. It's the first biography of Franklin Scott, Frank, Francis Scott Key in 75 years. As you know, those, the words that became the lyrics of our Star Spangled Banner were penned right here in this location more than 200 years ago. So I wrote a little note in there just so you, you remember what you told us. <laughs> no, 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 just to thank you for spending some time with us today and, and always being such a friend to the National Guard. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thanks, Dad. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm going to take you up got, on the selfie. You got your pen. Okay, okay, I'm ready. Ready. All right. Go. You got longer hair this time. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, the Sergeant of Arms, please escort our distinguished guest and her party from the platform.